It might sound like a rusty sewing machine, but there's a lot to be said for a system that just works. Got him! He's hit! Good shot, good shot. There's another! Welcome to Explosive Enterprises, and today we're talking batteries. Whether you're new to Airsoft or just expanding your knowledge, knowing what to look for in a battery and how to take care of it will help you save money, get the most out of your Airsoft guns, and avoid potential danger. First things first, it's 2023 and the overwhelmingly most common chemistry for airsoft batteries today is lithium ion polymer or LiPo. In the past, airsoft used nickel metal hydride batteries and in prehistoric times we used nickel cadmium and there are some oddballs like lithium ions which we'll get to, but otherwise it's pretty much all LiPos. These are affordable and have a great power to weight ratio, but they do have some quirks to be aware of. So let's start with stats. LiPo batteries are constructed from cells arranged in series, each one with a nominal voltage of 3.7 volts. Two cells makes a 7.4 volt battery, three cells makes an 11.1 volt battery, and so on. For AEGs, the general guideline is to stick to 7.4 unless the gearbox has been upgraded to handle 11.1. LiPo ready is just marketing, what matters is that the gears and piston can handle the increased stress. In addition to the voltage, batteries are rated with a capacity in milliamp hours. This is pretty straightforward, higher number is better with no downsides. As a very rough rule of thumb, you can expect an AEG to get one to two times this number in shots from a fully charged battery. The third characteristic is C rating, but this doesn't actually mean anything on its own. Take the C rating, multiply by the capacity in milliamp hours, and divide by 1000, and in theory, that's the actual maximum current in amps that the battery can safely output. Unfortunately, C rating doesn't have a formal definition, and there's little consistency among manufacturers, so take this rating with a grain of salt. As for why it matters, most AEGs will try to draw between 10 and 30 amps in continuous operation, so having a battery that can do at least 30 amps will ensure you reach your maximum possible rate of fire. However, the current can spike as high as 100 amps while the motor is accelerating from stationary, so the higher amperage you can get, the better your trigger response will be on semi-auto. And just to be clear, the capacity and C rating for both are pretty much irrelevant for HPA engines because their power draw is negligible. For AEGs, we suggest you start by deciding whether you want a 7.4 or 11.1, then find the highest capacity in a form factor that will fit in your gun, and then the highest C rating you can get for that capacity. Now you may have heard of Titan batteries, a different technology which offers very high capacity for their size, but lower C ratings. These aren't LiPos, instead they're just commercial lithium-ion cells wired in series with a protection circuit. I'm using stock photos here because I would love to show you ours, but our first Titan pack self-discharged after one game, killing the pack, and then the warranty replacement died after a few months without even being fielded. Throw in that their performance was poor when they did work, that we've met other people with similar issues, and that a lot of Titan's marketing claims are misleading or downright wrong, and we can't recommend them at all. Anyways, once you've gotten through the stats, the next thing to consider in a battery is the connector type. The most common connector types seen in Airsoft are Tamiya connectors and Deans connectors. Tamiya is the old standard, but the Deans connectors are more robust and have less resistance, so are slowly becoming more common on Airsoft batteries. That said, you get a lot more options and can save a lot of money by buying generic RC batteries rather than Airsoft branded ones, and then just soldering your choice of connector on. If you've never soldered before, this is a perfect opportunity to learn, so let's get into that. I start by plugging in a soldering iron to heat up, and position a set of helping hands with alligator clips on my work surface. Now I use a pair of wire cutters to snip just one of the wires. Let me say that again. Only cut one of the wires at a time, never both at the same time, because the metal of the cutters will complete the circuit and you might have a bad day. Plus, it's best to only have one wire exposed at a time, so there's no risk of accidentally shorting the wires. So now that I've snipped one wire, I use a wire stripper to pull the wire sheath from the end, exposing the copper wire within. I twist this to make a single coiled strand, and then slip a roughly one inch length of heat shrink over it and slide it all the way down the wire. Now I can clip my new Dean's connector to the helping hands, grab the wire with another clip, and verify that the wire can reach the terminal. Pay attention to the polarity here. On a Dean's connector, the red or positive wire goes to the square terminal, and the black or negative wire goes to the rectangular terminal. Now it's time to tin the surfaces. My soldering iron is hot, so I take my solder and touch it to the iron to tin it. I now place the soldering iron on the exposed wire, and then touch the solder to the wire so it melts and flows into it. 
Then, I touch the soldering iron to the connector terminal, and again touch the solder to it so that it settles a bead on the surface. Now I just move the helping hand so that the wire is touching the terminal. Then touch the soldering iron to the wire just until I see the solder melt and flow together. After a few seconds, it cools enough to be solid again, and I can test the connection. This seems good, so now I slide my heat shrink up over the connection, and wave the side of my soldering iron across the heat shrink until it shrinks enough to grab. That's all there is to it, so I just repeat for the other side, and ta-da, a resolder battery. If you have a gun with a Tamiya connector that you'd like to swap to Dean's, the process for resoldering the gun is exactly the same. Just be sure to use female connectors for your batteries and male connectors for the gun. Let's move on to charging. First things first, never use a wall trickle charger. To safely charge a LiPo, you really need a smart charger that can perform balanced charging and has a discharge function. A decent smart charger should run around $50 and it's worth every penny both for safety's sake and because it will maximize the lifespan of your batteries. Before charging, either set up your charger in a non-flammable location or place the battery in a LiPo bag. To use a smart charger, plug in both the balancing connector and the power connector. Make sure the charger is set to LiPo charging, then balance charge, input the number of cells, and set the capacity in milliamp hours. Hold the start button, and if everything's good, it will start charging. A 7.4 volt LiPo is fully charged when it hits 8.4, and an 11.1 LiPo is charged at 12.6. Balanced charging with a smart charger ensures that all the cells in the LiPo are charged to the same value, and that it doesn't charge beyond full. Well, after a few hours, the charger beeps to indicate that the battery is full, so now it's ready to use. But if I'm not going to use it, I could just store it in the gun, right? Absolutely not, for two reasons. First, any gun with a MOSFET will very slowly drain a battery plugged into it. That doesn't mean you need to unplug the battery as soon as you reach the parking lot, but leaving a battery plugged in on a MOSFET equipped gun is a guaranteed way to kill the battery with enough time. Second, even if you don't have the battery plugged into anything, a LiPo should not be stored fully charged for any longer than necessary. At maximum charge, a LiPo will undergo a process called electrolytic decomposition and slowly fill with hydrogen, causing it to puff up. Not only does this decrease performance due to increased internal resistance, but it's also a dangerous condition because higher resistance will cause the battery to heat up more, and now it's full of flammable gas. At the other extreme, a LiPo that drops below 3 volts per cell will also start to develop permanently higher internal resistance, and this can render it unsafe to charge again. So rather than full or empty, a LiPo should be stored at the storage voltage of just above its nominal voltage. Back on the smart charger, if we change the setting to storage and run it again, it will either charge or discharge the battery until it reaches the correct voltage for long-term storage. As a general practice, we recommend charging batteries the night before a game, and then running the storage function as soon as you get home, and this will maximize the lifespan of the battery. If you do have a puffed LiPo, or you manage to run a LiPo dead, it should be disposed of, but first it's necessary to ensure it has no stored energy remaining. One of the common recommendations we see online is to immerse the battery in salt water, in theory allowing it to slowly discharge through the conductive water. In practice, salt water will rapidly corrode the terminals until they stop conducting electricity, and you may wind up with a battery that still contains energy but can no longer be discharged. Not good. Instead, we suggest using the discharge function on your smart charger, but if the battery is so far gone that the charger won't recognize it, hook it up to a light bulb or computer fan. Either way, do this in a safe and fireproof location, let it run until the battery is completely dead, snip and twist together the wires to short it, and then dispose of it with electronics waste. Lastly, a few other general safety notes. Don't bend lipos. Don't leave them in direct sunlight. Don't crush them. Don't puncture them, and don't put them in a position to be shot with BBs like taped to a gun or in your pocket. But as long as you treat them with the respect they deserve, use a quality charger, and take proper precautions when charging and discharging, LiPos are a cheap, reliable, and effective power source for your AGs and HPA engines. That's all for today, so let us know if you have any questions or comments, and as always, thanks for watching.